In this episode, we interview Ashik, an organizer with Metro DC DSA and a steering committee member of the National Eco-Socialist Working Group. He talks to us about eco-socialist organizing at the local and national level. Hi, Ashik. Uh, hi, thanks so much for having me. It's very exciting for us to have you. So can we just get started asking, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in DSA in the first place. Yeah, sure. So I came th- to DSA and to left politics in general through climate organizing. Um, I had been um, working with a group called the Climate Mobilization since around 2013 or 2014 um, when uh, the US climate movement was having a a big period of growth and just um, really starting to make connections to other issues uh, that intersect and um, really trying to break past tendencies within the US sort of big green nonprofit dominated climate organizing space, um, trying to unpack a lot of the historical sort of um, just baked in uh, racism and, you know, white domination of those spaces and just framing of of issues in terms of just the science or, you know, sort of technocratic uh, frameworks of policy and just really trying to make connections um, across race and class to all the ways that climate change affects everything and how it's it's fundamentally caused by all these underlying systems of oppression. And of course, many of those nonprofits, uh, you know, some somewhat deeper than others and some didn't go so deep, but I think 2014 was maybe a turning point when a lot of those groups started to uh, engage in, in that kind of reckoning. Um, including the organization I was working with, uh, which was advocating uh, the scale and speed of, of mobilization against climate change that was actually necessary, which was much faster, like not as gradual, and also not as market-based. So that was um, an intervention that, that um, you know, plenty of scientists and organizers had been making for decades, that you, know, you can't just depend on the market to solve climate change, you can't just sort of tinker around the edges, and it's fundamentally an issue of justice, of unequal distribution of resources, um, which, which you know, is an outcome of colonialism and capitalism, fundamentally. So um, I think there were a lot of groups that were, you know, just starting to realize, like, okay, all these environmental groups are pretty white, they're pretty middle class or upper, upper class, um, their interests are, are really not reflecting the interests of most people, even though, like, most people have a lot to lose with climate. It just wasn't really clear how the more technocratic focus of a lot of these organizations was reflecting that. So I think um, the more I started to engage in that work, uh, uh, the more I started to realize the limits of organizing and nonprofits in general, because there are fundamentally limits on, you know, how nonprofits are funded through foundations or, you know, just the types of people that donate uh, tend to be limited in terms of race and class in that way. So I think um, after a few years of, working in that space, I just realized um, it just wasn't going to cut it. Like I I started to read more from from socialists who were writing about climate change and what was causing it and what it might take to solve it. Um, So that's how I started to read more about eco-socialism online, uh, which was a pretty, you know, small network of people uh, internationally who were uh, developing those ideas, which come out of, you know, traditional Marxism that's informed by climate science and um, indigenous organizing, especially, um, uh, and, and just global justice conversations that have been happening for decades, but been at the margins of US climate politics and international uh, negotiations. So um, I, th- I finally joined DSA in early 2017 after having been involved in the Bernie campaign in 2016, um, who was you know, like then the most ambitious uh, national politician on climate and was engaging with all these more left-leaning climate organizations. And then after he lost and after Trump got elected, uh, I was in Washington, D.C. and just, uh, you know, like many leftists, was feeling pretty despondent and was looking around to, you know, see who was doing anything that seemed remotely useful now that electoral politics was clearly reaching its limits. <laughs> um, and Metro D.C. DSA was there organizing in uh, really creative ways uh, around the inauguration of Trump in January 2017 and afterward. So I started to uh, go to meetings and um, there was just a huge burst in, in new members, as I'm sure you know. Um, so I was part of that uh, big wave of growth. And like a lot of other mostly young people, uh, many of whom in DC were sort of, you know, uh, uh, working in policy or nonprofits and feeling pretty disillusioned by working in those spaces. 
um, started to come together. And uh, there was a climate working group in my chapter that was starting to connect more with, with folks from other chapters around how we might organize uh, a left climate agenda and, and grow it in solidarity with folks who had been doing that work, but not been very well resourced. So the 2017 DSA convention, uh, which I wasn't at then, uh, but a lot of my comrades were, um, and, and that's when the National Eco-Socialist Working Group started. Um, it was then called the Climate and Environmental Justice Working Group because people were still kind of cagey about coming out with the eco-socialist branding. <laughs> um, but that changed pretty soon after it came together that summer um, and people just realized that there was a, a, you know, some utility toward just calling ourselves socialists and eco -soci defining eco-socialism as a clear pull away from sort of mainstream progressive climate politics that was still being defined as well. So um, yeah, so for the past three years, it's been a period of just really developing strong communication networks and really starting to share organizing strategies and um, develop campaigns locally and start to coordinate them more and more nationally. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, this has come up for us before in some ways. Uh, there's like a, this idea of um, issues being siloed on the left, right? So like, um, you know, like if you're doing, I think this is really, really true with any climate issues. It's like, that's the thing you do. It's just climate issues. And it seems so silly to me because it's so interconnected, like deeply connected to racial justice um, and all sorts of like other issues that really matter to us. So I was just going to ask if you had any other um any, any thoughts about that, like the issues with siloing these issues on the left? Yeah, totally. And um, again, just, just to sort of situate that question historically, I think, in the, in the way that climate politics has been developing in the U.S., there's just been such a sea change in the past two years uh, since the Green New Deal framework has sort of broken out into a more mainstream uh, political understanding. Before 2018, I think um, it was really difficult for a lot of people to, to make the connections from climate to anything else, even though uh, I think intellectually a lot of climate activists and organizers and, and especially see climate justice and environmental justice organizers had always been making those connections. And those networks tended to be more led by people of color, like really engaging with frontline and fence, fence line communities that are most affected by sites of fossil fuel extraction, as well as the impacts of climate linked disasters. Um, but I think that uh, that that baked in understanding didn't really break through until um, uh, probably the moment that a lot of people remember is when the Sunrise Movement and AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did a sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office. Um, I, I think the months after that really just made it uh, this very popular slogan among folks on the left, progressive more broadly, um, and just became a boogeyman of the right because they were so threatened by it because um, it's uh, this is a whole tangent we can go on about what fuels climate denial and why Republicans have made such a boogeyman about the Green New Deal, even while Democrats seem to still shy away from it. Um, I'd be happy to talk more about that. But just uh, I, plenty of folks had been making these connections for a while that in order to actually address climate change, we need to solve all these underlying systemic forces at once of capitalism and racism, um, j just because uh, they're the forces that make climate impacts disproportionately worse for so many communities that have already been harmed by capitalism and institutionalized racism in the United States. Uh, so like unless you're tackling capitalism and the way that it disproportionately um, harms people while profits are hoarded by the, you know, the, the forces that perpetuate um, uh, fossil fuel extraction, um, you're not going to decarbonize as fast as we need to, and you're not going to do it in an equi equitable way. Um, because there are also ways to imagine um, decarbonization happening in ways that still shift the costs and the burdens onto poor people, onto um, you know, indigenous people, onto people who've already been excluded from the, the wealth building that's, that's happened in the US and the global north for, for centuries. So I think that understanding that it's all connected, that a Green New Deal has to include, um, you know, things like a job guarantee, uh, things like, um, uh, you know, just uh, investing in infrastructure in ways that are about equity for people who've already been left out of, of capitalist systems of organizing resources. 
if you don't do that, you're not going to build a mass coalition for it. Otherwise, it just becomes very abstractly about, you know, parts per million in the atmosphere or, you know, targets for, like, even the word decarbonization is, is something that's, like, not very intuitive. So, so I think it's uh, really important to figure out what would make a mass politics out of climate, climate action. Like, how can people see something in it for themselves in a way that will improve their lives, not just be a sacrifice? Yeah, I think you make a really good point. I mean, it's funny, the point about decarbonization. It's like, if you're, you know, I'm running on a platform of decarbonization. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what is yeah. this person talking like, about? It sounds like something from sci-fi almost. Yeah, and that's why, you know, sometimes it's a little too easy for folks who are against climate action, for conservatives and like market-based people to just come back with like, oh, you're talking about cow farts and like you're going to, you know, prevent cows from farting like or whatever, you know? Because if you just make it about the carbon dioxide or methane or whatever, like that's very important for people to understand, but you have to really frame it in terms of uh, what it's going to mean for people's lives. So are you talking about banning all cars or are you framing it as we are expanding public transit so that it's you know, easy to access for everyone, it's free if possible. And then you know, we're going to like not just build entire cities so that they're constructed around cars but how can we make the good things easier for everyone to access versus just like, uh, you know, making it about your individual choice or like punishing you as an individual consumer for uh, like having to drive a car because you've been gentrified out of the neighborhood that's closer to where you work or, or, you know, just, just thinking about all the ways that um, people's like live day to day realities could actually be made easier. Uh, by the things that are good in a Green New Deal. Like with a 100% renewable energy grid, you could actually have free electricity if we construct it that way, if the utility is publicly owned and democratically managed versus the way that private utilities are just going to keep jacking up your prices um, even as they add renewable energy in a way that makes it more expensive for you, which makes plenty of working class people not want that <laughs> justifiably because they're already you know, having to eat the costs of austerity and um, all the other ways that capitalist government is making their lives worse. Right. So I want to, we want to ask you about your national work, but I'm right now I'm curious about um, the local uh, eco-socialist campaigns or things you were doing with Metro DC DSA, because I think, like you said, there's levels of abstractness, both in terms of, you know, we talked explicitly in terms of the language that you can use, but also in terms of the fact that it's a national thing and that also can be kind of overwhelming for folks and not able to really see how how is that going to actually affect me on the ground. So I'm curious what kinds of local uh, campaigns or work uh, your chapter has been involved in. And yeah, if you could say a little about that. Yeah, sure. So probably the most active uh, type of eco-socialist campaigns that are happening across DSA right now are campaigns for public power. So campaigns against the local energy utility companies that are usually privately run and monopoly utilities, which means there's just one company that controls the distribution of electricity in your entire area. So you don't have any choice. Uh, the company can just decide to, you know, raise rates uh, without citizens really having much say without like rate payers being able to do very much. They're usually managed in ways that are very hard to understand. Um, and it's even if it, uh, you know there's a public utility commission or something that's supposed to you know be the public uh, uh, public department or whatever that's that's regulating it, they're usually just captured by the utility company and stacked with people who are just going to make policy that is all about the utility company's bottom line. Uh, so anything like you know public hearings or meetings or uh, reports are usually very hard to find on the public government's website or anything. Um, if they even exist. So uh, a first goal of, of campaigns um, are, around this are just about making it uh, legible to people, like just making these uh, meetings or documents um, uh, just to let people know they're happening and what they're about. So that's usually where a lot of these campaigns start in, in places that we have big public power campaigns in DSA, like New York City, Chicago, um, uh, the East Bay, DSA, uh, Boston, a lot of them just started with gathering information, just spending a few weeks or months just looking at the regulatory structure of the utility just to see how they're run. 
and then seeing where there are entry points for for normal people, for working people to to try to intervene. So usually uh, there have been uh, places where well, one of the easiest places to step in usually is when there's a rate case. So that's when the utility is uh, having hearings around whether or how to raise rates on uh, people people's electricity bills. So that's where um, there's usually like, usually it's just a token thing of like, we're going to have some public hearings so that we can say we engage with the public. Uh, but usually they're, you know, still scheduled at odd times for working people. They're not uh, posted online or anything. So not many, many people show up. So this is a place where folks in DSA chapters have organized to get people to turn out and then also to, you know, live tweet or live stream about it and then show the, the folks in local government that this is something people are paying attention to and also uh, bringing in folks uh, from uh, other groups who've, uh, who, who represent community organizations who might not have the bandwidth to find these things themselves, but to just really uh, make sure that uh, the voices of people and people in the communities are, are showing up and, and being amplified in these fights. So that's one way to start. And then um, just by engaging with these, sometimes you can find places to, to actually try to change how these things are regulated. So um, most of these local campaigns ultimately have the goal of putting these utilities under public ownership, which is when you can actually um, have more democratic decisions made about what, like how to switch to renewable energy, for example. So just with the example of DC, um, uh, we have a cam campaign we're involved with in coalition with a bunch of other organizations called We Power DC. Um, that's ultimately trying to advance municipalization, like municipal public control over the utility, which is uh, PEPCO. Um, but right now is, is mostly focusing on, on rate cases. But um, in the context of DC, this, this campaign is pretty timely because uh, just a year or two ago, uh, Washington DC passed a really ambitious renewable energy goal of reaching 100% renewable energy by 2032 which is one of the most ambitious uh, timelines for reaching 100% renewables in the country. Uh, but the problem is uh, that Pepco is the private utility company that uh, you know, would ultimately be tasked with adding more renewable energy to the mix. And they're not gonna wanna do that because it cuts into their bottom line because it takes a lot of upfront costs to install more solar panels and wind energy and all of that. Um, but if they have their way as a private, you know, private a profit driven shareholder company, they're just going to want to pass the costs along to ratepayers, to people who live and work in DC. So, <clears throat> so, so just because of their bottom line, they're going to find ways to gum up the works and prevent that shift to 100% renewables, which we're already seeing. Like in any report that's come out about how that transition to 100% renewables is going, um, there are just all sorts of excuses made and, you know, they're just shifting it off further and further into the future. So, um, so the, the rate payer case is one way uh, to, to engage with, you know, how, how they want to pass on the cost to, con to consumers, uh, just to say like, no, we're not going to accept higher utility bills because the company has enough profits already to, to not pass it on to working people. Um, but also just to make the point ultimately that this should be run by the public and, and be as democratic as possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's so exciting talking about eco-socialist organizing on local levels for me, I think in part because the, the current climate disaster we're living in is terrifying and drains us so much, I mean, personally of hope. And when you think of it on this large scale, I think this is something capitalism really contributes to. It feels like, what can I do? Like I'm trying to recycle and that doesn't do anything. Um, but when we talk about it like this and you think like, oh yeah, we can actually get involved in these local lovers of government. And part of that, like you said, is figuring out ways to make it clear because they do everything they can to obfuscate how we actually change these things. But in doing it, it feels really hopeful, I think really energizing. Yeah, totally. And, and almost by design, um, a lot of green orgs um, just haven't really engaged with the public ownership fight. There are a lot of reasons why I'm sure that is some, you know, that are more charitable than others <laughs> to, to the motives of why they do or don't engage with fights like these. Um, 
a lot of it is just because um, uh, it's it's hard. I mean, it, it's hard to like build and sustain a campaign, especially one that you know requires uh, navigating through a lot of really wonky information. Um, but I think what a lot of the organizers of these local campaigns have found is that you know while you do need you know at least a few people to navigate that wonky stuff, once you start to make it you know uh, relatable and create you know good materials for educating and organizing folks around it, uh, you know, people who don't have time to like spend as much time as or organizing as many DSA members do. If you create entry points for people to just show up to meetings or, you know, send messages to local government, it can be like things can start to shift very quickly. Um, and I think that this is also a place where it's important to, you know, not just settle on one set of tactics or strategies, but this is these types of campaigns can really connect a lot of different types of organizing that folks in DSA like. From electoral organizing, like obviously you want people in government as much as possible to share your politics and you know be willing to use a role to advance the goals of a socialist organization. Um, so a bunch of these campaigns like Chicago and New York especially have really benefited from electing local council members and aldermen who are socialists because uh, they, they can then introduce legislation, uh, they can you know present like feasibility studies about how public ownership would work about these energy utilities. Um, and they can start to get more liberal members on board who aren't socialists, but see what a huge opening this is. Because uh, I think one thing that really excites me about these campaigns is just like their time really has come. Like it's becoming clearer than ever to lots of normal people, like how bad these utilities are and uh, how corrupt they are. Like uh, it's been in the news in the past few days, uh, this situation in Ohio where the, I think it's called First Energy, this utility company that manages nuclear power plants uh, has just been uh, bribing, like straight up bribing, uh, mostly Republican members of local government to the tune of like $60 million. And just like when somebody doesn't accept their bribes, they've like fully funded the campaigns of people to replace them. And then they've bailed out the nuclear industry and the coal industry uh, against any kind of public interest. And now people are really mad about it and the FBI is investigating them. <laughs> and then, um, you know, there are plenty of other countries where, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, not countries, parts of, the, parts of this country, like in Northern California, where PG&E has been uh, found responsible for the wildfires that have burnt down entire towns. Um, but because the government of California is so corrupt, they've just effectively bailed them out uh, because there hasn't been enough public organizing against it, even though there was a big outcry. So I think more and more people are seeing the stuff in the news and just seeing how much public money is going into bailing out these corrupt organizations. Um, and meanwhile, the clock is ticking on climate change in a way that's making more and more normal people anxious. So I think um, this is good politics, even for more liberal local politicians. Uh, New York City and D uh, Chicago DSA now have plenty of just mainstream Democrats coming to them asking for advice. Um, so electoral politics is an entry point to this, but it's definitely not the only one. There are tons of opportunities for direct actions uh, that I think all of these campaigns have been using to show up to local government or just you know bothering council members um, outside of uh, uh, government buildings or um, you know going after the CEOs of companies. There are lots of opportunities to um, you know to channel people's energy and, and make connections across issues. So I want to switch gears a little bit so that we can make sure to talk a little bit about what your involvement with the National DSA Eco-Socialist Working Group has looked like. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So I, I came to it through my local organizing. We had a local um, eco-socialist group in my chapter in, D in DC that then um, started to link more and more with the national group uh, that formed in August 2017. So initially for the first year, it was really just a, a listserv uh, and Slack channel. The listserv initially was just dominated by a lot of folks who love to post long multi-paragraph essays about what they thought should be done, <laughs> but not necessarily, you know, with the strong organizing bent. So I think pretty quickly we realized that organizing had to, had, had to be the priority as much as, you know, it's important to keep educating people about climate and eco-socialism. We really need to put it into practice. Um, I think that was probably, just, you know, the sort of growing pains, tension that folks across DSA nationally felt, especially in 2017 and 2018. And, you know, that, that tension definitely still exists. But I think across the board, people have been, you know, 
much more serious about how to figure out organizing like on this podcast. Um, so I think after the first year or so, we, you know, we, we established a Slack that was a productive space for folks to really uh, be sharing information about what kinds of campaigns they were thinking about organizing, what, what already existed, where they lived and where they thought they might build on it. Um, we started to organize more national calls uh, to share that information and disseminate it more easily. And then um, by 2019, uh, we felt pretty uh, confident that we could uh, pass a national priority campaign resolution. So um, one, um, so, so part of why the Eco Socialist Working Group formed in 2017 was because it wasn't chosen as a national priority. So at that convention, there were three national priorities chosen, uh, which were all very good priorities, Medicare for all, uh, labor organizing and electoral work. Um, and climate actually, I think came in third, but just because nobody felt prepared to start a climate campaign, um, they decided to go with uh, that, that other set of three first. But we, we decided that, you know, we really wanted to be ready by 2019 to have a national campaign. So we spent a lot of time uh, in the national working group uh, over the course of uh, 20, like late 2018 to the summer convention of 2019, um, figuring out what that kind of campaign would look, might look like. So um, a big part of that was coming up with a set of principles for a Green New Deal uh, of eco-socialist principles, like what we wanted a Green New Deal campaign to really center um, in ways that it might not if, if socialists didn't engage in the national uh, coalitions and organizing around it, because it's, it's very easy to see how any kind of climate effort, uh, even one that builds itself as, as progressive and equitable could very easily be co-opted by capitalists and just become, you know, green capitalism. Um, so there was a really long deliberative process over a few months to draft uh, principles that, that I could talk about more, uh, but by, uh, by the summer uh, that was accepted by national DSA with buy-in from a lot of chapters. And then in August, um, we presented a resolution that passed uh, with pretty overwhelming support at the national convention. So I think since then, um, we've been uh, really trying to be very thoughtful about what that campaign should entail, like how to link the existing campaigns around public power into a national for uh, formation and coordinated effort. Um, we felt pretty confident by March of this year that we were ready to launch something big. Um, a big point of that was the Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, Bernie had a great Green New Deal platform, the, the most ambitious national climate platform that we've ever seen a viable candidate get behind. Uh, unfortunately, that failed. And then within weeks, COVID started. <laughs> so we pretty much threw out everything we had in the works um, at the window just because people couldn't physically go outside. So um, rather than just, you know, trying to decide in a top-down way what the Green New Deal campaign should be going forward, we are uh, developing a, a, a summit process um, to uh, bring together representatives from a lot of chapters that are doing eco-socialist work to just talk about what existing chapter capacities are, like what folks have learned from the campaigns they've worked on, um, where what the limits are, and where we think we could be ready to intervene in the, in the next year or two. Like what are the things that a Green New Deal national campaign really should focus on? And what do we have the capacity to actually try to win? So, um, you know, not just being idealist about it, but really try to ground it materially in our capacity as an organization and, and what we think the broader left, like working class forces in the United States are in a position to win and what kinds of coalitions we need to win those things. So how people can plug in. Uh, you can definitely join us uh, through our website, ecosocialist.dsa.usa.org slash join. And there's just a form you fill out that you can then use to join our Slack and we'll serve. And um, then you have access to all the calls that we're planning. Um, we, we try to be pretty regular about calls for the membership, um, as well as public facing calls that are meant for education. Um, and then the Slack is really where uh, the magic happens of, of people just making, you know, making their own links with each other rather than the central committee facilitating everything. And um, without that collaborative space, I think the public power campaigns wouldn't have developed to the point that they have. Like a lot of it just happened with local chapter members just starting to collaborate with each other and share information and then, you know, getting to the point of being viable enough that 
the steering committee is then, you know, uh, given a mandate to really uh, help disseminate it to other members and help plug more, more people in. And, and part of the challenge of Green New Deal organizing, I think, um, as opposed to, like, for example, the Medicare for All campaign, which is one of DSA's, like, uh, you know, most um, recognized and long lasting campaign so far is, is that like Medicare for all is, you know, recognizable as a single program that you could imagine passing in a single bill, but a Green New Deal, like by necessity is, is much bigger, like climate touches every sector of the economy. So it's, it's hard to imagine uh, just because it touches so many different things. Like we're not expecting that it'll pass in a single bill in Congress. It'll require a lot of struggle across a lot of different sites. And then that could be presented to government in all sorts of ways. But there are a few things that we want it to center, which we can talk about more in, in the context of the principles. So I guess one last question I wanted to throw at you is if, if you are a DSA chapter and you haven't really done eco-socialist uh, work before, but you, you know, you care about it. You have, you, you care about it, right? You have some theoretical like analysis of what, what the issues are and you want to do something about it, but you don't quite know how to get started. What advice would you give to um, people in that position who can actually get enough people to maybe do something? What, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's just great at a baseline to have some kind of formation in your chapter that does political education, where you can just start at least by, you know, getting lots of people in a room who don't have experience and just having somebody who's knowledgeable, but also, you know, can present it in ways that are relatable to just lay out, um, you know, like this is an eco-socialist framework, like this is, uh, and we have plenty of educational materials at National that do that and you can develop that for your own chapter to adapt it and change as necessary. Uh, but beyond that, I think, especially with these energy campaigns, it's it's probably important to have a core group of, like, even a handful of people who can just put in the work to um, use a lot of the materials that other chapters have already come up with and see what makes sense for where you live. Just because the regulation structure of utilities is so complicated and varies so much uh, from state to state, from city to city, from region to region, that... It, it does require a little bit of legwork for people to figure out, you know, like, do you already have, do you already have a public utility, but it's not very democratically run? Do you have a, <clears throat> a private utility that's, you know, a city utility, or do you have one that's state, uh, like statewide, or yeah, just what are, like, what is the actual structure? And then, you know, start to put in some work after you know that to figure out like how they operate and who is making the decisions, like how can government change how that's regulated. So I think it takes some work to just figure that stuff out, uh, which for the first chapters to develop these campaigns, I think it took months for some of them, but I think now that a lot of those have, the chapters have collected all that information, it's much easier for us, for, for other chapters who haven't done this kind of work to come to the National Working Group and ask for help. And, you know, uh, folks in other chapters can, you know, give that kind of guidance and mentorship to talk about how, how that got set up. So something I, that's so, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say something that's so exciting to me about this is there's so many similarities between this kind of organizing and our other kinds of organizing, tenant organizing, labor organizing, in that it takes, it sounds like from what you're saying, it takes power mapping, right? Like really understanding what's going on on the other side and also understanding what your resources are. You know, who are your members? What do they have? What can they bring to the table? And who can you get together to help as well as who are the people who hold uh, sort of the keys to the kingdom here? Yeah, exactly. It, I mean, for my chapter in DC, I think uh, this campaign and a campaign that we did before this, which was around uh, public banking and just a, a, about trying to get the city of DC to divest from its uh, $2 billion banking relationship with Wells Fargo and explore the creation of a, of a public bank. Uh, that campaign ultimately lost what we were trying to win, but uh, just by engaging it with it, we learned so much about local government and how um, you know local meetings translate up into city council and how the different bureaus of DC make decisions about different parts of the local economy. So I think that information directly informed this utility campaign now. And um, 
just by developing a campaign that you know involves going to local government meetings and town halls you start to develop the skills as a chapter to really plug people in very easily like for as long as the the dc reinvest campaign was active uh, we were really good at just pumping new members in uh, just by having easy scripts people could follow to you know to send emails and make calls and all that, but also to directly lobby their local uh, community meetings um, and show up to meetings and give presentations and develop those local, uh, like hyper-local relationships with government that then, um, you know, starts to establish DSA as a local force to be reckoned with, but also helps develop members' skills to, to engage with government or outside of it, like through like strategic direct actions that make sense to, to change how people think about an issue. So I think um, in my chapter, it was really good at, good at plugging in folks from across tendencies politically, from across uh, you know people who who like different kinds of organizing, from direct action to local uh, electoral politics, and um, that I think that campaign helped create the conditions where this year we actually just elected a, a council member uh, to city council. Well, not elected yet. She won her primary in a very heated primary. We elected. Uh, uh, Janice Lewis George, who is a black woman who uh, ran on defunding the police. Um, and I mean, that's a whole tangent, but uh, she was attacked really hard by an opponent who was sending out mailers saying like, she's going to defund police and make the communities less safe, like a week before the uprising started <laughs> um, after George Floyd's death. And that ended up just, you know, probably making lots of people like her more. And she ran on, uh, you know, not taking money from Pepco, the utility, and is probably uh, we we are pretty hopeful that we, she'll be a strong ally for any utility campaign that we expand. So so yeah, I think the more that chapters like try to think about how not to have campaigns in silos, but how they can really inform each other and build on each other, uh, the stronger a chapter can be. And um, I, I think like one thing we've heard from a lot of uh, DSA organizers across chapters is that, you know, there's probably an upper limit to how many uh, active campaigns a chapter can have without just starting to compete with each other and like, you know, distract from people's attention. Um, and, you know, that, that varies by chapter size. Like so in some, it might be like two to three campaigns max. In some places that are really big chapters, it might be like five or six or 10. But generally, like what, what we hear is that the more the chapters can find ways to, um, you know, just to develop really strong relationships across different efforts, the, the more they can build on each other. So I think campaigns around utilities could be one way to have a campaign that's, you know, really focused on engaging local government on, you know, getting familiar with budget processes, which is really useful now in the context of defunding police, right? Where um, that's, that's a worthy goal in and of itself, but also people can start to think about what we want to reinvest in in different ways. So um, there might be links that, that are worth exploring there. There actually is with energy utilities because uh, there, there was a study published just uh, in the past two weeks that found that energy utility companies and fossil fuel companies are heavily investing in police departments, like just directing private resources to police foundations, which is on top of their municipal budgets, which is nuts. So there, you know, you can really start to see that <laughs> The role of the police is just to enforce private property and um, the energy companies are making that very clear. So that could be the basis for, for local campaigning as well. Well, thanks, Ashik. I mean, I, I feel like I got so much information just from this and I feel like you have a, a, a ton of more information actually give about this stuff, especially I like when you're talking about um, uh, not campaigning in silos and how these things are interconnected. Um, but I want to say, yeah, I just want to say thanks for yeah coming on to the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, like I said, check out our website, ecosocialist.dsausa.org. And uh, a really important document there that you can check out is the guiding principles for a Green New Deal, which lay out seven uh, things that we really want to center in organizing around climate. Um, uh, so yeah, the central principle there just being like decommodify survival, meaning that, you know, someone's like nobody's basic needs to live should depend on their ability to work or to pay, which is just more important than ever in the context of this economic crisis where tons of people are, be, you know, in danger of being evicted right now. 
they're probably going to be kicked off unemployment. So I think um, now more than ever, we really, we, we really need to think about what a just recovery would look like from this crisis. And a Green New Deal, if done right, could really address a lot of the needs people have right now and help change things for the better. So the challenge is to figure out how to organize to win it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We've learned a lot and we have so much more to learn. So I'd love to talk to you again in the future. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, let's be in touch. Yeah.